Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to the very first Something Wicked This Way Comes book study. So very excited to, to be here for this. And I just checked on the uh, on the YouTube and it, it, there's always a weird delay between StreamYard when it goes live and when YouTube actually puts it live. So I've noticed that my intros have been cut a little bit. So I start waiting those few extra seconds. So that's what I'm doing. If you hear that awkward silence or just Al breathing and nothing's being said for a second or two, that's what's going on. But with me as always is my trusty TA, Big Al. Say hi, Al. Hi, Al. Are you excited? Oh, I have not been any more excited since. Oh, God, when? I don't know. <laughs> Are you enjoying the book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, still, you know, still in its building phase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what a build it is. It's so great. Bradbury's just a, he's a master. Learning, learning, learning about the town and already wondering what's that chick look like? <laughs> yeah we'll talk about her <laughs> so welcome to the chat welcome muhammad casey scott uh casey scott said no prof here looks around my stream now Bwahaha. what oh 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 you were here before i came gotcha 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 crazy kitty welcome red wolf ben welcome welcome super ben there our red wolf ben oh, as you are to be known super... now well he'll always be super ben <laughs> yeah he'll always be super ben to me um yeah, so we got uh, – this is going to be fun. This is really cool. I'm really excited about this book. I'll give it, give people a few more minutes. I know Stephen Cruz is uh, very excited to be here too, so I'll at least wait until he pops in here before you he actually get started on the study proper. But uh, how's your day been, Al? Um, quiet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> I what what did I do? I, I actually did do a lot of napping today because last night, you know, mm -hmm. it's always you know always a late always a late night, and I was kind of worn kind of worn out, so I just kind of played it played it low today watching. Yeah. We had a the office. <laughs> we had a blast on the Monster Squad rewatch. If you guys missed that, go back and check it out. It was a lot of fun. So God, I love that that movie. It's just so it had been a long time since I'd seen it. I'm so glad to have it part of uh, last night's festivities. Yeah, we've got to just go sit on Fan Man and make him watch it. He would love it. I can't believe he hasn't watched it. I know, I know. It's just crazy. The Monster Squad, for God's sake. I know, I know, I know. Fan, I mean, this is like you not having watched the first Alien movie. I know, I, which I have by now. Yeah. Yeah, see, now you have. But yeah, they were shocked to realize yeah. I hadn't, so they had to correct that. Uh, welcome to Net Pacelli. Is Troy here as well? Welcome, welcome. Na, 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 net. <laughs> Age of Boomer, welcome. He did the reading. Age of Boomer's already. Muhammad says, I just got a really nice idea for art for the book study. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, show it on. Crazy Kitty said, I planned on being there for the rewatch, but I had a busy day and planned only a 30 minute nap. Then, boom, three hours went by while sleeping and didn't get to watch it. Yeah, you know, I've been there. I've done that. Yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> Those unplanned marathon naps. <laughs> Did you hear the horrible news today, Al? Um, if it's what I think you're thinking of, yes, I did. Rick, Rick Ocasek. Ocasek. Yeah, man, that stings. You know, I'm not always like, and every time a celebrity dies, everybody's like, oh my God, I die too. I'm like, people die. They get old and they die. And that, that guy, you know, didn't do anything for like three decades. So chances are well, he's going to die soon. But man, Rick Ocasek passing, that hurts because he was, um, I loved his music and still do. I mean, I was listening to his music just the other day. Uh, whether generation. His, yeah, I know. Whether the cars, he, he was a great uh, solo artist as well. And a lot of people don't know that he did a lot of producing. I mean, he's the one that really got Weezer their start and gave them, helped them anyway, build that signature sound on their first album anyway. Um, and, and not considering his life's greatest achievement. He was married to Paulina Forrest Gomez. Well, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's something to that too. <laughs> God. Uh, I mean, when, when a man, and you know, God rest his soul, but when a man that uh, uh, unattractive can land a Paulina Poroskova, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> 
Uh, Casey Scott said, fan man has something wrong with him if you want to watch Monster Squad. I know. I agree. Janice Zeal, welcome. Muhammad says, damn, prof, that was straight up savage. What'd I do? Straight up savage. What was straight up savage? Oh, we're talking about the slough? No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry anybody dies, but I just think it's a little disingenuous yeah. when like, all of Twitter well, is just, uh, you know, oh, I'm crying my eyes out because this person passed. And, you know, like you haven't even thought of that person in 20 years, um, you know, but, you know. Well, they're, you know, they're like, well, like at, the other day, any money passing. Yeah, something like um, that. That, that, that. That sucks. That sucks. And, you know, because I, I liked his music and sure. Uh, and everything like that. And, uh, like I said, Rick Ocasek, I, it sounds like you were much more, it was much more ingrained into your, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Psyche than, than mine. I mean, but I, you know, I, you know, like I said, I was a fan. I, you know, I love those those early videos. Yeah, that that was. I'm sorry, that's MTV. Nothing. Oh yeah. Now. Oh heck yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to go ahead and, and give it a start here. Don't know where Mr. Stephen Cruz is, but uh, he'll he'll join us eventually, I'm sure. Uh, welcome, Sertorian Clegane, Fred Leggett. Welcome, welcome. Haven't seen you around it for a while, Fred. <clears throat> so, um, let's uh, first. Uh, I do want to start out with a uh with a little promotion piece here before we jump into the book because this is related so tales from the stacks has just bumped up quite a bit today we're almost at twenty three thousand. look at that five dollars away so if only one of you in the Ooh. chat wanted to add on the five dollar bookmark get the complete set no extra shipping it's just make sure that you receive all three of them for five dollars you could put us at twenty three thousand. So go in there. And the reason why I'm pimping this uh, first up on this Something Wicked This Way Comes book study is because, as we talked about before, and many of you have kind of suspected, the first tale in my Tales from the Stacks book here, uh, drawn by the great Ralph Del Mundo for this this uh, Lady Anana story. This uh, story, I originally wrote this as a prose, a short prose piece, and it was going to be um, submitted to a Ray, Brand Ray Bradbury tribute anthology. And uh, didn't make it in time, so I just, you know, I wrote it and I had it sitting around. It ended up going into my MFA thesis, and then I loved it so much that I went ahead and um, translated it to comic script for this uh, collection. So these three young boys, mid-60s here, trying to sneak into the Lady Inanna's exotic sideshow at the State Fair here. Uh, <laughs> really cool stuff, and, and the art's just glorious. These are just the first two pages, but uh, really great stuff. Wait until you see Ralph. Uh, really showed Lady Anana's dance, this big two-page spread of her twirling around and doing all the stuff and, you know, taking the certain things off and, and oh, using yeah, the certain uh, things and all that. I saw the, uh, I think I saw the rough of that, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to show you the finish. Yeah, but, uh, I, can't yeah I can't wait to see the finish. The good stuff. Yeah, so Tales from the Stacks, we got uh, four different artists, connective pages with the librarian beckoning you into the stacks to tell you the tales. Those are by Dave T. Lady Anana's story by Ralph Del Mundo we just looked up. Illustrator Monk is handling a fire in winter, winter story. Those are his two pages. I want to put the lettered pages of those up tonight. But uh, Illustrator Monk's gorgeous art. And then, of course, the great Kyung Lee doing the third and final tale in the story, Discovering Evelyn. There's his variant cover and two of his pages right there. He sent me some more art the other day. Looks fantastic. So uh, just waiting on the rest of that art to come in. As soon as the art comes in and Ishii letters it, boom, we're closing down the uh, Indiegogo and going to print. So if you're waiting, I'll put this at the bottom of your wait list. This goes to the top because this could end any any week now. So, so good stuff. So I just wanted to one day it's just, one day it's just not going to be there. Exactly, exactly. And then people will be emailing me saying, "Oh, can you can you keep it going for one more week?" I'm like, "Dude, you had since last February. <laughs> yeah, you're saying, you had <laughs> since Valentine's Day. <laughs> so we got to go to print at some point. Uh, so yeah, don't miss this one." But uh, all right, Let's see who else has popped in here. I missed while I was doing that. Uh, Meta Nui is with us. Paladin Mata demo. Mata Mata Nui, Mata Nui, Mata Nui. All right, Paladin demo, Meta Nui. Did like it. Talked about that. Uh, Vilnid. I love all Radbury, but probably prefer his sci-fi to his gothic style tales. Yeah, he's great at sci-fi too. He's great at sci-fi. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome. And Troy Pacelli popped in very good. We need about seven more to... likes, Troy says. I agree. Go get them, Al. I need to... Do it. 
<laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that was last night. That was last night's avatar. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. This is Big Al. Hey, guys, <laughs> come on. Be nice. <laughs> Give us some thumbs up. We got 21 watching. I want at least six. I want 17. Give me a 17. That's a nice number. Four more. <laughs> Just want four more likes. Please. Please. Uh, pretty please. Please, please, please. Please, please, please. Four more likes. Please. Please, please. Villeneuve Three more likes, please. Please, please, please. <laughs> Do it now. We're going to start singing that damn Muppet song. No. <laughs> um, Villeneuve... I will. I will. Trust me. Al's not going to let me start Al's until you guys give a thumbs up. So. Al's not <laughs> He's just gonna keep well, talking right I, over me. I... <laughs> I'll defer to the professor. Sorry, <laughs> you told me to go get him. You unleash the hounds. I did. I did. I did. That's my fault. That's right. That's right. Uh, welcome, Lego Lego Ferris Studios. You're just in time. We're just about to start. And uh, yeah, uh, Vilni was asking how about how many parts we're gonna switch this or divide this up into. And it's a short book, so I would like. It's 53 chapters with an afterword that I think is worth going over too. But the chapters, like you know, we said, are only about three pages long per piece. I think we could do this uh, feasibly in three more parts, and that would give us enough time to do another book, at least start another book before Halloween proper. Um, what do you think, Al? Uh, I, I that would be about another 10 or 11 chapters next time again, just like this one. Was this... Whew. Was this chunk a big one for you? I mean, the chapters are three pages, though. I mean, come on. Yeah, it wasn't a big chunk. I was just, honest to truth, I was just having trouble getting back in the swing of listening. Oh, yeah, yeah. Again, I, I'd start. I'd, I'd gotten back into the habit of watching things, and mm -hmm. now, now I have to, like, get back into the swing of, of reading and doing the audio. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we will definitely watch the movie, Crazy Kitty. <clears throat> definitely. Welcome, uh, Tatooine, too. And, um, did I receive Milan's cover yet? Yeah, yeah. Um, Tatooine, uh, go on the page there. Actually, I'll show you real quick. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have Malin's cover when I uh, when I opened up the campaign, and it was my first campaign, so I didn't know that you're unable to edit these thumbnails for the tiers over here once you go on the campaign. Because I thought I'd just add his cover there, but no, his cover was he came in like a week after I started actually, and it's right here. It's the uh, it's this one. So it's the big one up there. This that's John Malin's cover with Kyle Ritter's colors. Gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. So, yeah, his that's stuff's there. The summer and winter cover, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a fire and winter. Fire and winter. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> a fire and winter. There's winter and red. Yeah. So this is uh this is Malin's cover there. Colors by Kyle Ritter. Yeah, but that's confusing because it uh, unfortunately I didn't uh, didn't realize I wouldn't be able to edit and add the cover there. So, but just want to clear that up. Mm -hmm. So I like that cover. I know, yeah, good stuff. So, welcome to Comics Bear, uh, Vinny Art. Welcome, welcome. Yes, back ghostly manner on Howling Hill. Let me do this one last shout out before we start, because uh, just to give Stephen Cruz time to get his butt in here. Um, ghostly manner. Look it up here. Although he did just drop the link, but this is really cool and it's perfect for Halloween. And it's Vinny, our good friend Vinny here. His um, his art's awesome, and. We've looked, talked about a lot of his work on my stuff before. He's actually going to do a cover for my next comic. And this is uh, his Halloween book right now, The Ghostly Manor on Howling Hill. Really cool stuff. And uh, you definitely want to give that a chance. It's, it's child friendly, but it looks really fun and Halloween, you know, infused in the spirit. So it's just going to be a lot of fun. So definitely give that a check out. He dropped the link in the chat. So go to it. Love that. Good stuff. <laughs> that does look cute. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> so. Um, all right, now on to something wicked this way comes. So it's um, I was going to show a, a video clip, but I don't know. I don't want to get the get in trouble with copyright or something like that. But um, <clears throat> there's a great there's a couple of different clips out there about uh, Ray Bradbury talking about how he came about writing this story, and um, he doesn't really go into at least the clips I saw the specifics of why he wrote what he wrote. Yeah, you know, we'll delve into those with the themes, but it is an interesting story. So I'll just kind of uh, re um sum it up here basically the, uh, this story had existed in some sort of form as a very short story that i don't think he ever did anything with at one point but after he wrote martian chronicles i think that came out in like 50 1950 uh gene kelly of all people gene kelly the great you know musical dancer singer director uh 
wanted to wanted uh, called Ray Bradbury to see him because he loved the Martian Chronicles so much. That's something you don't hear every day, you know. So Ray Bradbury <laughs> and Gene Kelly are meeting, and they're both geeking out because they both love each other's work. And uh, they got to be friends. And Ray Bradbury wanted to write a script for Gene Kelly to uh, to do, you know. So he took the he went back and looked at his work, and he found this little rough short story, and he developed it into a, a, a screenplay. And uh, Gene Kelly actually shopped it around, but they couldn't get funding, so that kind of died out. And then much later, eventually, it fell into the hands of a couple people, but Disney ended up with it, and that's the the movie that we have. Of course, Disney ended up making a god-awful movie to begin with, horrible film. Bradbury hated it. He kept telling them, no, don't do that. That's a mistake. And eventually, they uh, they realized that they did a screening, and everybody hated it. So uh, they brought Bradbury in, and he was like, now put me in charge. <laughs> so, so he pretty much ended up directing it over the original director and, uh, and, and re-editing it and all of that. And that ended up the movie that we have, which we are going to do a rewatch of after we finish the film. So uh, cool story there. But uh, – but there's so much to this book. Following it up on it, I think, is a great, uh, great idea. Do you see some of the connections thematically yet, Al? Or you just kind of nose into the story first? Um, yeah. Oh, de- oh, I'm definitely seeing the similarities. The uh, I'm already starting to see. There's like the, although it's from different characters, the difference between um, childhood and adulthood. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, good versus evil. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause we know that's coming and even like, and, and although it's not seven in, a, in a, of a losers club, it's these two, mm-hmm. um, Will and Jim, Will and Jim. Yeah. Will and Jim. Yeah. Will, yeah. And, Will and Jim. We'll talk about those uh, names here in a second. So, so definitely I, I have a feeling that's going to be a friendship that's going to be tested. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm go- and I'm going in and I'm going into this. I've seen the movie. But I, for the life of me, can only remember bits and twigs and pieces of this. <laughs> uh, of it. Uh-huh. It, it, it was one time, a long time ago. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's got a, some great. Oh, it's just great. Let's just dig in. So let's look at the the uh, epilogue or the ep- epigraphs first. And these are the little quotes, you know, that you can put um, often for, at the beginning of of works and stuff like that. And it's um there's some things that writers tend to do like this. They try to emulate this, uh, this approach to the beginning of books with this and the prologue. And I caution against it. You've got to be, you have to be damn good to write a prologue. If you're going to do a prologue to your story, you better be freaking Ray Bradbury himself. And everybody wants to write a prologue because everybody likes to, you know, talk more about their own universe and, you know, wax poetic about this thing that they've created if you're Joe, Joe nobody and, and nobody knows your name, no one gives a crap about how wonderful this story is and whatever get to the damn action. That's what mm-hmm. I would, you know, I tell writers all the time, unless, you know, until you become Ray Bradbury or you're so freaking amazing at writing that you can really do a prologue. Well, like this, um, you know, skip to the action, but this is a masterful prologue, but just these epigraphs, these are great quotes, you know, going into the story. We'll come back to them as we get into the meat of it. But, uh, WB Yeats, um, Man is in love. And, uh, Yates, I'm sorry. I get him mixed up with Keats. Yates, Keats. Yeah. Uh, man is in uh, love and loves what vanishes. Very uh, apropos. And then a quote from Proverbs 4. They sleep not except that they have done some mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. And then uh, Stubb from Moby Dick, of all things. I know not what may be coming, but it will. Uh, but be what it will, I'll go into it laughing. Now, I love these three epigraphs here because by the end of the book, we'll come back and look at this. And this is pretty much a summary of the whole story. It's really fascinating. I love that. Um, <clears throat> see, Muhammad says, Professor Geek, an evil force that represents fears between adulthood and childhood and children facing unknown forces that are metaphors for unexpected turns in people's lives. Haven't read that book. Yeah, exactly. So solid, similar themes here. <laughs> Uh, Troy says Bradbury had a way of describing emotions and internal thoughts. Absolutely. Absolutely. So look at this prologue here. Um, like I said, when you, when you're discovering a new writer or you're, you're giving a new story a try, it's a risk to do anything, but just jump to the damn story, get into the writing, you know, um, it's, you know, these days it's a risk, but, but this prologue Bradbury is so amazing with the language and he just carries you away. And, and by the end of this very short little prologue, 
you're you're in you're in you're 100 percent. you know what's going on you're into the theme so i'm actually going to read the prologue's a page and a half in my book it's not even that because it's um actually it's more like one page yeah it's barely a half a page yeah on mine. yeah so i was going to read this and we'll look at what he does here he says first of all it was october a rare month for boys all right that first setting right there he tells you what month this story is going to be set in october that brings with it its own connotations but now he talks about and it's a rare month for boys so this is going to be a story about boys and boys lives and it really is really getting into the to the interiority and the psychology of boys at that cusp between boy and man and even older men looking back at boyhood with charles holloway you know will's father uh not that all months aren't rare but there be bad and good as the pirates say all right, so why he's he's already playing in the childhood mindset. There be bad and good, as the pirates say. You know, he's not just being stupid with that. No, he's pirates because little boys playing pirates and stuff like that. Take September, a bad month. School begins. Consider August, a good month. School hasn't begun yet. July, well, July's really fine. There's no chance in the world for school. June, no doubting it. June's best of all. For all the school doors spring wide, and September's a billion years away. That is brilliantly written. He's in the voice of a young ch of, of a young boy. Uh, he's putting you and with that with the way with his prose there. He's putting you in um, in the story. In the story, Matt and Nui, go go take a hike. Then I'm sorry you're so bored. Get out of here. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Matt and Nui, he's always our resident smartass here. Uh, but you take October now. School's been on a month, and you're riding easier in the rains, jogging along. You got time to think of the garbage you'll dump on old man Pritchett's porch or the hairy ape costume you'll wear to the YMCA the last night of the month. Now, this is a little dated, you know, um, mm -hmm. in terms of culture and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it was written, was it published 60, something like that, I think, 62 or something, maybe. Uh, and if it's around October 20th and everything's smoky smelling and the sky orange and ash gray at twilight, it seems Halloween will never come in a fall of broomsticks and a soft flap of bed sheets around corners. But one strange, wild, dark, long year, Halloween came early. All right, that's so that we're still not done. We got like one more paragraph of the prologue here. But boom, you know, he's, he's telling you, you know, he's, he's likening into a universal experience. Even now with the cultural mm -hmm. changes, we still have that, you know, that time of year we remember being children. Um, and then it it picks up the, the foreshadowing. But one year that, uh, you know, Halloween came early. So, you know, we know something's going yeah, on. We know. So setting up so, and setting up something kind of. Not so good. Yeah, <laughs> ominous. And giving us an ominous taste yeah. there. One year, Halloween came on October 24th, three hours after midnight. And this is one thing, too. Be specific with numbers and colors as a writer. As specific as you can with numbers and writers, uh, numbers and colors, because that helps the readers picture images with the colors. And they, they think you actually know what you're talking about. And you're not just weaving something you know out of the air. You're actually talking about a story that you've nailed down the details of. Um, at that time, James Nightshade of 97 Oak Street, again, 97 Oak Street, was 13 years, 11 months, 23 days old. Next door, William Halloway was 13 years, 11 months, and 24 days old. Both touched toward 14. It almost trembled in their hands. And that was the October week when they grew up overnight and they were never so young anymore. How can you not want to read this book after reading that <laughs> prologue? I mean, unless you just you don't care about Halloween or that you could care less about little boys' experiences, you know, that and that's fine. Maybe it's not to your taste. If you're a little girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, if, if you're anywhere near the target audience of this book, that prologue, I mean, I remember reading this for the first time in high school and I was like, give me, you know? <laughs> give me more. I want to read Screw homework, screw whatever the teacher's saying right now. <laughs> you know? So it was, uh, I just had to read this. It's, it's so amazing. So we go through, um, first of all, Al, uh, now that we're done with the prologue and we're getting into the story, any, any general reactions to the, um, you know, you talked a little bit already, but anything you kind of liked spe specifically or had a question about or didn't like so much, uh, so far. Yeah, I'd love to change my name to Nightshade. <laughs> good point. Good point. We can talk about the names. Yeah, that's just a just a great. I mean, come on, <laughs> uh, just a just a great name. Like I said, it, after reading that and then you know getting started in the story, everything I've pictured there is no sunshine. Mm -hmm. It's dark. It's late at night. There's storms. There's a storm coming. So I'm picturing a, a darkness looming. 
and and with this storm, it's been ten chapters, and the storm's not there yet. Yeah, I mean, there, I, <laughs> well, mean I was like, I was like, okay, but but I know it's it's going quick, and it's still it, you know, it's that the first ten chapters are gone, but it's almost like you know, I'm waiting for the storm to happen because I really want to see if uh, Jim's house gets hit. <laughs> well, with, with the lightning, it's like all this stuff that I'm waiting to see happens, and but I just I'm just picturing this idyllic little town mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. probably probably 24 hours before this was perfectly fine, but now it's just about to get dump trucked with evil, mm -hmm. and it's just so all the like you said you said all these ominous uh, things are happening, all these uh, f the foreshadowing, the carnivals coming, the the lightning rod seller. Uh, all the, uh, and, you know, you're learning about Jim's father who really does not seem like a very happy man. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's like, it's so far, everything is just, uh, a for that foreshadow of, of bad things to come. Yeah. Now you just say like the, title, like the title reads. Now you say that it's been 10 chapters and, uh, the storm hasn't come yet, but yeah, it's been 10 chapters of three pages long and we're only now late well, night you know of I mean, that evening that. but yeah i know what you mean um, I, but yeah but that, that's just it it's it's just late night and i and i get it but like i said i find myself anticipating the storm mm -hmm, mm -hmm. waiting for it one you know wondering oh it's still it's still coming it's it's, it, it's still i can hear it you can just barely hear it over the hill <laughs> what i love about this 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 is this, this uh, oh man, AJ Boomer said, put down something wicked this way comes. You have a report on a day no pigs would die. Oh my gosh, I hated that book. And that was about the time I read this too. Piece of crap book. I mean, that and Ethan Frome. What the hell is teachers trying to put into our heads? Anyway. Um yeah, so the idea of the storm, but this this atmosphere is building up the metaphor of the storm, which I really love. So mm -hmm. we get this, we open up with this lightning rod sale salesman. Which is kind of an odd thing. I know there were salesmen, traveling salesmen. I know lightning rod salesmen, you know, existed. I know people had lightning rods. You need to buy them or whatever. But this guy's definitely romanticized. He can kind of sniff out a storm. Um, with the name of this town, Al called it an idyllic little town, and it's called Green Greentown, Town, Illinois. Right. So it's right there in the middle of the, uh, you know, mid middle America there, um, or mid, whatever it's called, you know, middle of the United States there, um, and. Uh, Right there, the green town, it's green. So we're, we're playing with a lot of images of seasons. So already, even before we talk about age, well, the prologue already set us up with age, but we're also talking about time, the passing of time, the passing of seasons. October is fall. October is when things begin to die, begin to age and die, you know, in, in uh, nature. But this is still green town, but there's a storm coming to green town. And uh, the salesman sees these two young boys and he, he – um, I love this. Uh, of a light, a, two young boys of a like size and general shape. The boys sat carving twig, uh, twig whistles, talking of olden or future times. Content had their fingerprints on every movable object in Greentown during summer past, and their footprints on every open path between here and the lake there and the river since school had began. So you get the idea. You're setting up these boys. We know they're 13, but they're also really ready for a grown-up experience ready to to de to develop into something beyond boyhood right now they they've done it all yeah. they, they've you know they've exhausted boyhood in the town basically coming of the is the coming of age yeah yeah and uh you mentioned names alan that's great the names are a big uh they're, they're uh you know some you right. might somebody even think they're on the nose but i think they're really great so will and will and jim are really two sides of the same coin here in some ways in fact you could even do a sort of a psychological reading of the book and read them as one person and uh you know it, not literally but metaphorically and one's you know the the good angel and the bad angel so to speak you know <laughs> But um, Will William Holloway, and they call him Will. So this is the Will, and we'll see him be the Will to act throughout the book. He is the Will, you know, the Will that's strong. Uh, Holloway, the meaning of the name Holloway, nightshade's easy to see. Nightshade, you know, we know what nightshade is. Also, it's night. Um, he's the darker one of the two. But Holloway, uh, it, the name came from one who lived by a landmark, one who lived by a hill, or a uh, you know a a church or something, you know, over by the hallow, the Halloway, you know, um, the idea of, of will being sort of this, um, this lighthouse, so to speak, you know, this, um, you know, uh, gu guiding compass even, you know, got that in the names there. And, uh, 
Well, you get, I mean, you look at the description of the, t- uh, of the two, you got Jim Nightshade, dark hair, mm-hmm. the more sullen of the two. And then you have Will Holloway, yep. who is the light hair and he's cheerier and, and happier and more happy go lucky. Mm-hmm. And I did, I did read and, and something is like it, the name Holloway also meaning like the holy way. Yeah, the good, yeah. The good way. So it's another, it's another twist on the name that could yeah. be done. Yeah, I didn't come up with that. I, I, I read that somewhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I Troy, thought it was worth. I thought it was worth including. Yeah, definitely. Troy says, along with the lateness and passing of the wistfulness about growing up, you have it also illustrated by the carnival coming late in the year. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This carnival. It's. Uh, we're going to talk about that big time. Um. So day and night, you know, they look like day and night, their descriptions. Um, also, as the idea is, I love the, these lightning rods. I love it what he said. So he pulls out one of the lightning rods. He gives it to them. So the, so Tom Fury, this salesman, is a good is a good person, right? He's giving them this lightning rod because he knows that the lightning is going to hit one of their house. And lightning, you know, this storm is a metaphor, like I said. It's, it's a literal storm, so there's literal danger from the electricity, but there's also the storm of adolescence that's coming, you know, on one hand, but not even, I just don't even want to reduce it to that. Even the storm of the decisions you'll make, the dangers of adulthood, the dangers of leaving, which we all have to do at some point, we all have to leave the innocence and wonder of childhood. And we want to maintain as much of it as we can, of course, and all that kind of stuff. But you do have to step out of that to grow up. And there are lots of dangers surrounding. Will you go serve your uh, your appetites and give in to the dark temptations of the world? Or will you remain on uh, the way that uh, your, your childhood set set your steps upon, you know, that faith of childhood or something like that, you know, the straight and narrow kind of thing. I mean, it's built in here. So this storm, I also think it's so cool that Jim recognizes a scarab beetle as Egyptian because no child would do that today. Mm -hmm. Talk about lost knowledge. Oh my gosh. Kids are just dumbasses today. (laughs) I I love them. I mean, I love my nieces dearly, but they have, what's Egypt? Where's Egypt? What the hell's that? You know, know, growing up with films like the mummy. Yeah. You find out these things. Yeah. You, You learn these things, you know, I used to work at uh, Ashland Highland, which was President James Monroe's uh, home or his land there. And I had a group, a school group over from London. They were literally from, you know, London. It was a school group there doing some thing or another. And they were touring and I was giving them a tour and I pointed out some portraits of, uh, you know, this who so and so is one of Monroe's daughters who was um, a student of a lady in waiting to marry Antoinette. And I was like, so of course you guys would know Mary Antoinette. And they're like, who? No, no, man. <laughs> I can't. Oh, Goodbye. I'm out. That's, Check it that's, out. That's, that's physical, I guess that's physically painful. Physically yeah, I know, painful. I know. I know. I know. Uh, we have here in um in Tom Fury one example of of how to weather the storm of adulthood. Right. Uh, this is uh tonight. Jim sat up happily about the storm. No ordinary storm, said the salesman. Tom Fury tells you Fury ain't that a fine name for one who sells lightning rods. Did I take the name? No. Did the name fire me to my occupations? Yes. Um, Growing up, I saw cloudy fires uh, jumping the world, making men hop and hide, thought I'll chart hurricanes, map storms, then run ahead, shaking my iron cudgels, my miraculous defenders in my fists. I've shielded and made snug safe 100,000 count them God-fearing homes. So when I tell you boys you're in dire need, listen, climb the roof, nail this rod high, ground it to the good earth before nightfall. Um, this is great. This this picture develops more. So his name is Fury. His name is of the storm. So why would his name? It doesn't necessarily follow that his he had to make the choice that his, he being named for the storm he would protect against the storm rather than cause the storm. I mean, your name is Fury. That could go in a number of different ways. You could end up putting the Avengers together or whatever. You know? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Darn, you stole my joke. <laughs> <laughs> but. uh but I love this. You know, he, he takes it upon himself to be the protector. And then um, to weather this storm, nail this this symbol, nail this uh, th- this this uh, what do I want? Th- this this icon, this um, image, right, hey. you know, a protection, nail it to the roof of your home and ground it into the earth. You know, that's that itself is an image of, of adulthood and responsibility, you know, uh, under- and- understanding that the power of symbols yet remaining grounded. Mm-hmm. 
and the, and you're talking about the symbols. I mean, the the lightning rod itself. I mean, it was like had a crescent and a cross. I mean, it had two religious symbols on it right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Good point. So, um, so we leave this chapter, and you you stop me out if you want to break up anything that I'm skipping over. But yeah. um, I like I love the idea too. Again, I mean, we can lament how children just are, well, no one, children, adult, whatever, no one reads it today. I mean, thank God all of you here who are actually reading this book, but uh, no one reads it today. You know, kids. You know, the, 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 I love the idea that there was a time when kids actually went to the library for fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that's so we are in our past. But I love this. The library deep slay waiting for them out in the world. Not much happened. But here in the special night, a land bricked with paper and leather, anything might happen. Always did. Listen, a thousand people screaming so high only dogs feather their ears. A million folk ran toting cannons, sharpening guillotines. Chinese, four abreast, marched on forever. Invisible, silent, yes. But Jim and Will had the gift of ears and noses as well as the gift of tongues. You know, so I, I just love that. This was a factory of spices from far countries. Here, alien deserts slumbered. I mean, that's just, that's the wonder. Of, oh, I just love it. Sorry, English teacher, I'm geeking out about that. <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking um, about line. I love, I love the one line that Fury says, Ham when you're talking about hammer it high, you're dead come dawn. Yeah, yeah, that's good too. Yeah, hammer it high, you're dead come dawn. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> Something old folksy about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost, um, he, hearing hearing that in my head, you know, just and picturing him, you know, you just kind of have this weird picture of him. Mm -hmm. Yep. Muhammad said he went to the library as a child. Age Boomer says, I hear kids won't even watch black and white movies. Oh, no, not even children. Adults today, like, eh, with black and white, it's boring. Like, I don't ever want to talk to you again. That's <laughs> what, I was like, oh, I mean, I think, oh, God. Remember when, oh, what's his face? Was trying to colorize all the all the all the movies back back when. I know the color. Yeah, I hate colorization, but I don't know who you're talking God, about. In particular. I, um, yeah. the, uh, own own the Braves. Um, started TBS. Oh, Turner. Uh, Turner. Not Ted Turner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was he was behind a lot of the colorization, and that mm -hmm. is just that's 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 peeing on the exactly. Mona Lisa. Absolutely, absolutely. So we meet uh, Will and Jim. It's after dinner. They ran to the library here. And then we meet Will's father, Charles. And uh, I love this moment when Will sees his father. And you get this idea of their um, there's a disconnect between the two. And both of them know it's weird, the age difference between such a young child and an, an older man. But I want to point out, too, that Charles, if you do the math, he feels old. He's allowed himself to settle into this idea of old age because he's only 53. Now, that's old if you're like, you know, 20 or 30 or something like that, you know, sure. Old, you know, comparatively or whatever, but just in the like 53 today, that's, that's not really crazy old. I mean, it's not like you're, you know, hobbling Thank around you. in your seventies <laughs> or something. Right. I mean, yeah. So like, I don't, I don't think of Al right now is like, Oh, what an old man you are, Al. You can't, you can't be into these boyish things. You know, I think the point is Charles has settled into his age. You know, that's what he's feeling. He's just kind of like allowed himself to settle into it. Can, can I say something? Yeah, of course. Uh, I did not realize that I was the same age as, as Jim's father. <laughs> I'm actually older than his father. Oh, God. I mean, there are legit concerns. He's like, I can't go out and play baseball with him. And, you know, maybe his, you know, um, physique or physical um, situation isn't such as that. You know, that's fine. But Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it all comes home to Al now. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But I like this. Uh, so looking back down the corridor was dad shocked to see his own son who visited his separate 20,000 fathoms deep world. Dad always seemed stunned when Will rose up before him as if they had met a lifetime ago and one had grown old while the other stayed young. And this fact stood between. And that's pointing out that even though they're two separate characters, you know, uh, Will and Charles, father and son, for Charles, Will is a representation of the boy that he no longer is, you know, so that's what he's mourning his boyhood. And we'll see Charles's character progression. And is he going to reclaim his his boyhood? Is he going to um, make the wrong choices in order to reclaim it or, or reclaim it in a right way? You know, we'll see that kind of go through as we as we progress. Uh, I also like um, that they're both into the books. And I love that. Uh, <laughs> Jim, eyes darker, cheeks paler. You burn yourself at both ends, Jim. Heck, Jim said. No such place as heck, but hell's right here under A for Alighieri. 
allegories beyond me, said Jim. <laughs> talking about Dante <laughs> Alighieri, but he thinks he's talking about allegory. How stupid of me, Dad laughed. I mean, Dante. Look at this. Kind of warps him in by the pictures of the souls tortured in Dante and everything. I think that's a neat thing. Um, Dad winked at Will. Will winked back. They stood now, a boy with corn-colored hair and a man with moon-white hair. A boy with summer apple, a man with winter apple. A man with a summer apple face and a boy with a winter apple. A man, a boy with a summer apple, a man with a winter apple face. Dad, dad, thought Will. Why, why? He looks like me in a smashed mirror. Just that language and just the building up of this uh, of these images. I mean, you can't. He's uh, he doesn't beat you over the head with the themes, but he lets them come around again and again in a way that like if you don't get these themes of age and coming of age and looking back upon youth and all of that stuff, then you're just not reading the book, you know? Well, I mean, that's all there is to that. Um, mm -hmm. Sad and funny to see the word. His father was here all in his shadow. Shadow. We'll look at shadow, too. We've talked about how Jim uh, looks as though he's in the shadow. And uh, Will, it made Will sad and funny to see that light, that light. Because uh, we're talking about in the nighttime when his, his dad is over at the library reading because he can't sleep. It made Will sad to see the light in the library window to know the old man. He stopped to change the word. His father was here in all this shadow. So we'll look at shadow and see what we want to make of that. Um, and then I like, uh, I like uh, Charles's talk about the hats. What kind of hats are you going to wear? Do you remember that part, Al? Uh, oh, yeah, about uh, extra black Stetson. That'll yeah, yeah. White boys to you. Well, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you know, and that's that's there too. But also the that's idea of it's the, you know, it's their char it's their characteristic too. Mm -hmm. And you're going to become a man. What kind of man are you going to be? What kind of hat are you going to wear? You know, so that he uses it right here, which is in what sort of taste they have in books. But that's a question that you know any any person has to ask as they grow older. Um. Okay, moving into the next one here. Uh, watching the boys, so Charles watches them. I love this uh, talking about their friendship. You know how um, they uh, again. This is a chapter that that sinks into the the reverie. But this is Charles' uh, interiority talking about how the Will would break one window in a haunted house since he's with Jim, but Jim would break two since he's with Will, and uh, how we sink our fingers into the clay of each other and try to mold each other, and you know the nature of friendship and all that. Really great musings. I'm just trying to move on so we don't take too long here. Um, now, this is interesting. So they come to this uh, nine o'clock chimes. And, you know, this is the night. The, the storm's coming. So people are feeling it. People are, are sensing it. And uh, listen to the language here. It, just describing what's happening, the language is also leaning toward leaning into the themes. Uh, Will stopped. Will looked at the Friday night town. It seemed when the first stroke of nine banged from the big courthouse clock, all the lights were on and the businesses humming in the shops. But by the time the last stroke of nine shoots fillings in his teeth the barbers had yanked off the sheets powdered the customers trotted them forth the druggist fountain had stopped fizzing like a nest of snakes the insect neons everywhere had ceased buzzing and the vast glittering acreage of the dime store with its 10 billion metal glass and paper oddments waiting to be fished over suddenly blacked out shades slithered doors boomed keys rattled their bones and locks People fled with hordes of torn newspaper mice nibbling their heels. Damn that imagery. That is just gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous prose. But the word choice, you know, he's talking about um the the, the wonders of daytime, the, the druggist fizzling soda fountain becoming a nest of snakes, uh, the uh the, the keys rattling their bones in the in the keyholes, you know, in the doors. This is age, right? It's the chiming of a clock, it's the passing of time, and the imagery moves from light, vibrant, vibrant lively to to aged words like rattling their bones and you know um slithering and stuff like that and, and rushing home and stuff like that so and the the um yeah, i just think it's great i just love it. it's great anyway mm -hmm. sorry I I can tell. Out about that so we get <laughs> what's up <I> yeah can <laughs> tell. <laughs> they have these weird moments with uh with uh, the, the Mr. Tetley, the guy who runs the tobacco shop, and then Mr. Cressetti, the, the guy who runs the uh, barber shop. And I love the idea of this pole. I mean, you got to get the imagery of the pole, right, Al? The symbolism of the pole. Uh, do you tell me about it. 
the the idea that Will looks at the pole and it just it where does it start? Where does it go? But it continues. It's just a cycle and it continues oh, rolling okay. up, rolling yeah, up okay. from nowhere into nowhere. It continues, you know. And uh, leave it on. It has to be on overnight because something's ominous out here tonight. You know, it's the idea of age, the idea of cyclical time. You know, but everything is like nothing is wasted. All of the little details work toward the theme. It's great. Um, and like although we we know it has a beginning and an end, it seems like it's like always moving forward going forward yeah or up or up in this case i yeah. think with the barber pole crazy kitty uh a little bit of historical information about the barber pole barber shops used to do every everything including bloodletting and that's what the uh red swirl coming up mm -hmm. from the bottom yeah because the barbers which would be basically surgeons basically they do dentist work and stuff like that too yeah um so Charles has this moment where he sees the guy he sees the illustrated man basically we'll find out later that it's the illustrated man um dark uh putting up these posters putting up the handbills for the the carnival coming and this is where it really gets interesting we really get into deep in, deepening the themes here so he, he goes over and, and looks at this poster that the man's put up it's a cougar and dark's pandemonium shadow uh and it's in this it's in a window of a vacant store so a store that the carnival's kind of taken over here cougar and dark's pandemonium shadow show so pandemonium that's a name for hell right in um in dante i believe um Fantasini, Marionette, Circus, and your Plain Meadow Carnival. Arriving immediately, here on display, one of our many attractions, the most beautiful woman in the world. The next line, directly. Halloway's eyes leap to the poster on the inside of the window. The most beautiful woman in the world. And back to the cold, long block of ice. You know, so that sort of tempting man thing. Hey, here's the most beautiful woman in the world. Where? Where? <laughs> Where? <laughs> um. And then I love this image. Look at this. The most beautiful woman in the world is frozen. What they call the most beautiful woman in the world is frozen in this block of ice. And he doesn't even see her, but the impression that she would make. He sees the absence of her in this frozen state where no, no life can come in this frozen state. Um, Halloway felt his heart pound one special time within the huge winter gym. Was there not a special vacuum, a voluptuous hollow, a prolonged emptiness which undulated from tip to toe of the ice? And wasn't this vacuum, this emptiness waiting to be filled with summer flesh? Was it not shaped somewhat like a woman? This is the a wonderful picture of the anima. There's a, so much of a Jungian read you can do to this um to this work, but the idea of your dream woman, so to speak, or whatever, but you get so locked onto it that any time you start looking at a real flesh and blood woman, uh, you know, and they don't measure up or whatever, because you're looking at this cold, lifeless thing. Perfect. Perfect as it is. It doesn't breathe. It doesn't move. You know, um, it, it's a vacuum. It's an emptiness. It's a beautiful, lovely, sexy, voluptuous emptiness. You know, the, the idea is a perfect picture of that. And, yeah. Um, um, it was a little creepy that, uh, at, again, well, uh, dark as we find out it's going to be mm -hmm. was whistling a christmas tune yeah good point i'm glad you brought that up yeah we'll come back to that yeah <laughs> yeah um and specifically the i uh, heard the bells on christmas day you know which is right. why is why is evil prevailing why is uh you know hate so strong and all of this stuff and um god's not asleep he is not dead you know so we'll come back to that that does play a big part yeah good, good, i'm glad you put a pin in that for me Checking in with the comment section here. Muhammad said, do you edit novels? I'm writing my book and listening. It's helping a lot. Yeah, yeah. I edit prose, comics, anything. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Not just comic books. So, yeah. Um, Chrissy Katie said, I thought it was a metaphor for the art art with frozen women. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pictures, but that's all part of the, the male, you know, anima. You know, the images that you see and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's all part of it. Paladin Demo said, water and ice tend to distort images. Good point. Good point. Um so here we go. The uh, okay, moving on. The next chapter, we'll come back to to Halloway and Charles's. Uh, we'll come back to Charles's experience and the effect this this woman this this side of this this absence of this woman has on him. And remember the icy imagery. Remember the ice, this cold ice. You know, we'll come back to that. But first, let's go to uh, little Mister Peeping Tom, Jim Nightshade. <laughs> what do you think of that, Al? <laughs> Yeah, he's he's pretty he's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I love how this played like, out. Oh, we, go, we saw something there. <laughs> Let's go back to the theater. <laughs> the theater. 
And so, yeah, Jim, uh, Jim wants to go down a certain street to look into a certain house. And then you find out <laughs> why. And I love how it came about. I love how the boys discovered this. Do you remember? I'd how? go back. I'd go back too. <laughs> so they were climbing trees, picking fruit, like doing boy shit, boyish things, you know, uh, picking apples, picking peaches, picking whatever, you know, doing the boyhood stuff that they would do. And one day while they were up in the tree picking the fruit, they happened to look over in the evening time and there's this big open window with no curtains. And this couple's basically just getting it on over there. And they don't even know quite yet. I mean, this is another thing that's culturally different. I mean, by the time you're like, what, seven years old, you've already seen pornography today. I mean, it's just, you know, it's crazy. But, you know, yes, once upon a time, you could be, you know, kept from stuff like that, you know, uh, you know, even into 13 or whatever. So these boys, they don't quite know what's going on. They know a little bit. But they don't quite know what's going on. This couple's just having sex pretty as you please with no curtains or anything. They've got a full view to it. They're just stunned. <laughs> and I love the the, I, the uh, way it was written. I can't I didn't mark it. But uh, uh, okay, I think I've got this. Like, and well, hang to the limbs of the tree, tight, tight press, terribly excited, staring in at the theater. Mm -hmm. That peculiar stage where people, all unknowing, flourish shirts above their heads, let clo let fall clothes to the rug, stood raw, and animal crazy, naked, like shivering horses, <laughs> hands out to touch each other. Good. Yeah, what are reading. they doing? Thought Will. <laughs> Keep reading. Why, keep reading. Are Why are they laughing? What's wrong with them? What's wrong? <laughs> we we wish the light would go. We wish the light would go out. Oh, poor kid! You have so much ahead <laughs> of you. But he hung tight uh, to the sudden slippery tree and watched the bright window theater. Heard the laughing, and numb at last, let go, slid, fell, lay days, then stood in dark, gazing up at Jim who still clung to his high limb. Jim's face, hearth flushed, cheeks fire fuzzed, lips parted, stared in. Jim, Jim, come down. But Jim did not hear. Jim! And when Jim looked down at last, he saw Will as a stranger below with some silly request to give, to give off as a, a living and come down to earth. So Will ran off alone, thinking too much, thinking nothing at all, not knowing what to think yeah there you go so i love this idea so they they see i want to unpack that a little bit they see this now both of them being boys are just instinctually captivated you know um and yet will you know chrissy says he's afraid of puberty well yeah any any human being is going to be afraid of the changes and the things that you don't understand coming you know out of puberty uh but will's got a special um reaction to it jim jim's all in jim's like yeah, yeah. This is life, you know. It can't even. Oh, Will, Will wants me to come away from life. What the heck, you know? Um, not that you know, not that sex is bad or anything like that. Of course not. But this idea of, um, I mean, they're peeping, right? Will's got the, Will's got the conscience. Will's got the, you know, maybe this is not where I need to be right now in my life. Watching a, set, a couple have sex through a window, you know. Uh, but Jim's just all about seeing everything he can. You know, he talks about that and that idea that this is a chasm growing between them. We see it here really truly begin with the idea of this house and will doesn't want to go back but jim is like pleading and begging to go back you know and jim's calling will all these kind of names at the same time jim you, you kind of a creepy little dude here come on yeah. you know? <laughs> let's go back to the theater you know um so this Muhammad, is, muhammad's like is this a kid's book <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah well I, I, it is because you don't really like we're it, we're telling you what's happening, but the language you could be a child reading this and really not quite even get it. You know, maybe they're just dancing. What's going on? You know, I mean, the language doesn't explicitly tell you unless you know you you know enough to read through what's going on there. Uh, so they so they eventually meet back up and uh, you know they kind of make up or whatever about not um, you know he doesn't want Jim going over there or whatever. He says yeah yeah sure you know it won't be the last time whatever. So they go back home. They go in their separate uh, homes. Now here's where I want to go back to Charles. Remember Charles's image there of the frozen, um, the most beautiful woman in the world, frozen, a frozen emptiness and absence thereof and juxtapose this with Will's mother. Um, I'm going to read this a little bit here. Uh, Will said his mother's fingers twitched. Her mouth counted the happiest woman he had ever seen. So now that we got, we've gone from the most beautiful woman to the happiest woman. He remembered a greenhouse on a winter day, pushing aside thick jungle leaves to find a creamy pink hothouse, rose poised alone in the wilderness. That was mother, smelling like fresh milk, happy to herself in this room. 
Happy, but how and why? Here, a few feet off, was the janitor, the library man, the stranger, his uniform gone. But so you got the mother juxtaposed with this, you know, the most beautiful woman in the world, the untouchable, the perfection that's nothing, that's an absence thereof, juxtaposed with the wife, you know, who I uh, like when um, <laughs> the father says uh, the, the lion, the statue of the lion sprung to life and started prowling the town for Christians, but didn't find any. We've got the only one here held captive, <laughs> you know, the mother. <laughs> um, and and uh, so I like that juxtaposition there. And then you see Will uh, seeing. Will starts to pick up that something's going on with Dad. Dad mm -hmm. is seeing this handbill, too. He sees the handbill in his father's hands. He wants to say something about it, but he doesn't. A soft uh, Walking upstairs, Will heard what he half expected to hear, a soft, fluming sigh as something flesh Something fresh was tossed on the fire. In his mind, he saw Dad standing at the hearth, looking down at the paper, crinkled to ash, cougar, dark, carnival which wonders he wanted to go back down and stand with dad hands out to be warm by the fire instead he went slowly up to shut the door of his room so he would like to have sort of comfort from his dad at this point about this new time of life but they're both so enamored with their own struggles uh charles wanting to go back to th this time and will fearing this time you know that they kind of they're, they're kept separate and then this idea of listening to his father's voice at night i love this um this is where you get it starts to really pick up. And, and this is, I think, the last. No, it's not quite the last chapter. We're close here. Um, Will makes me feel old. So Will is listening to his parents talk through the wall. And Charles says, Will makes me feel old. A man should play baseball with his son. Not necessary, said the woman's voice kindly. You're a good man in a bad season. That's what I think is the real point here. He said, hell, I was 40 when he was born. Well, again, he's 13. You're only 53. It's not like you're decrepit, for crying out loud. Um, and you, who, who's your daughter, people say. God, when you lie down, your thoughts turn to mush. Yeah, see, Charles is just, he's settled into this mental state of old. And we'll see how he what he does about this one way or the other towards the end. But um, Will heard the shift of weight. His dad set up in the dark. A match was being struck. Um, a man with posters under his arms. Carnival, said his mother's voice. This late in the year? Will wanted to turn away, but couldn't. And then he hears his father say, most beautiful woman in the world, dad's voice murmured. Mother laughed softly. You know I'm not. No, thought Will. That's from the handbill. Why doesn't dad tell? Well, we know why he doesn't tell, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, Will answered himself, something's going on. Oh, something's going on. And so, so, so Will picks up on something. He, he knows the same things that he sort of, drawn to but terrified of or is also having an effect on his father you know so part of growing up too is not only dealing with the struggles and the new uh desires the new pitfalls of adulthood but also growing up and realizing that your parents aren't perfect right that's part of growing up too realizing that they're not the you know, um, you know it, i love how that chapter ended yeah but i'm almost wondering um because when when with Char with charles having the handbill crumple mm -hmm. i was getting a sense or or reading into it he knows more than one he knows more than he's saying and almost like he's trying to protect will mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i just was those are two things that were i was kind of mulling over i think that's incredibly astute of you al I have to give you points for that. Uh, I'm not going to give anything away what may or may not be, but you do have, let's just look at what we've seen thus far. You've got a man who's lived through all of this. Mm -hmm. Part of him is longing to go back for it, but part of him too knows the danger of it and wants to keep his son from it. So you do you, all this conflicted, you know, like he said, thoughts turn to mush, you know, but yeah, that's a good thing to pick up on. Absolutely. Um, then talking about the Jungian shadow, you know, I said that you could do a Jungian reading of this pretty well. We, we switch over to Jim lying in bed. His mom's going to come in to tell him good night. Uh, Will Halloway, it was in him young to always look just uh, the trouble with Jim was that he looked at the world and could not look away. When you never look away all your life, by the time you're 13, you have done 20 years taking in the laundry of the world. Basically, it's telling us that Jim's a little nihilist. Jim is becoming a little disenfranchised. He's going to be one hell of a moody little emo teen right you know that's that's what he's developing into here well, with, um, a, with a name like nightshade he's gotta be i know i know and will is still the hopeful will is still holding on to some faith of childhood um jim knew every centimeter of his shadow could have cut it out of tar paper furled it and run it up a flagpole his banner will he was occasionally surprised to see his shadow following him somewhere but that was that 
again, shadow, you know, so they're talking about literal shadows, but also the shadow self, all of your dark sides, all of your dark inclinations, um, you know, the, the, the dark parts of you, you would keep hidden and not show the world. You know, Jung would say you need to know that and integrate it into yourself so it doesn't rule you. Both of these young boys, Jim, Jim wants it to rule him and Will's just still denying it or unaware of it. So they both have some character progression to do here, you know. Um, but yeah, you get this little idea is like, uh, uh, why, Jim, your hands are ice. You shouldn't have the window so high. Mind your health. Sure. Don't say that. Just don't say sure like that. Um, you'll, you'll know once you've had children. I'm never going to have any, said Jim. You just say that. I know it. I know everything. She waited a moment. What do you know? No use making more people. People die. <laughs> Talk about like crank the nirvana. Come on. <laughs> oh, he's, he's like the, the little goth kids from South Park. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Paladin well, was his goth ability for the time period. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'm never going to own anything that can hurt me. You know, he says, and his mother's saying, you know, you're going to get hurt. Um. Point out. Okay, so the storm. He thought he's no. I love this. He's talking to the storm. This is ominous. Jim alone raised the window and leaned into the absolutely clear night after his mother leaves. Storm. He thought. You there? Yes. Feel away to the west. A real humdinger rushing along. So you got the storm talking back to him. Man, that's freaking terrifying. That's the. You're, the dark urges, the temptations, the darkness in the world, the spirits in the world, the evil in the world, you keep looking for it. It's going to look back at you. It's going to keep talking. It's going to seek you out if you seek it out, you know? Um, yeah, that's, that's, woo. Uh, so, oh, I, I, no, I, go ahead, please, please. Uh, sorry. Uh, there's this part here. It's like, uh, mom, a long, a long silence. Can you remember dad's face? Do I look like him? No, oh, good. Uh, she says, the day you go away is the day he leaves forever. Mm -hmm. who's going away and i was just wondering is like are we gonna find out whose dad is because um, because i don't know it's just with a name like nightshade and you got a guy named dark it's kind of spooky yeah, yeah a little bit spooky well we'll see we'll see i don't want to give anything away or, or pushing okay. anything Spoiler. over you know, like his mother um what's that spoilers, yeah. spoilers. <laughs> um trying to find the part here he looked at her. Her face had been hit a long time ago. The bruises had never gone from around her eyes. You'll live and get hurt, she said in the dark. You know, so what, you know, what kind of father was he? You know, you start to, you know, you know hints are dropped here and there. So, we'll, you know, thus far. Mm -hmm. But the final chapter we're going to discuss tonight goes back to our good old friend, Tom Fury. And uh, he is walking along the street here and he walks past the most beautiful woman in the world, that storefront there. The lightning rod salesman's smile faded. Um, in the dreaming coldness of ice, like someone fallen and slept in snow avalanches a thousand years, forever young was this woman. So forever young, right? We're going to get this theme of uh, go back, reclaim your youth. You know, what's the what would you trade for it? She was as fair as this morning and fresh as tomorrow's flowers and lovely as any maid when a man shuts up his eyes and traps her in cameo perfection on the shell of his eyelids. Love that. Talk about the anima, you know, and and now that's not necessarily wrong. I mean, when a man's like, you know, taken with a woman, especially a young man, you're you're not so much. I mean, you are you can be enthralled with that woman and a crush on a specific woman. But there's a part, especially when you're younger, there's a part of you that's just like so enamored with the iconic femininity, period, that you see channeled through this one woman that you know you've chosen to, to have this crush on or whatever and uh you know i love that idea closing your eyes and still seeing her frozen in perfection you know um where's this other part? once the the cool rod is behind you. oh sorry no no please do please go ahead no, it's just, the, uh, just the one sentence the lightning rod salesman remembered to breathe yeah, exactly. the, yeah, the, proverbial, <laughs> the proverbial breathtaking beauty uh-huh you know, yeah was, yeah yeah I've, yeah I've been there been there. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, there, there are several women in my life I have seen, either in life or in picture, where you, it literally your breath just gets that uh, hitch in your breath. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, she did take my breath away there for a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to find the first instance of this. Um, uh, okay. 
Uh, okay. So um, once as a boy sneaking the cool grottos behind a motion picture theater screen on his way to a free seat, he had glanced up and there towering and flooding the haunted dark scene, a woman's face as he had never seen it since of such size and beauty built of milk bone and moon flesh as to freeze him there alone behind the stage shadowed by the motion of her lips, the bird wiring, the bird wing flicker of her eyes, the snow pale death shimmering illumination from her cheeks, the snow pale death shimmering illumination. So there's this idea of, a, um, there, there is sort of an instinctual um, evolutionary terror in in man because woman, you know, watching, you know, listen to some Jordan Peterson if you want to get better explanations about this. But uh, women are the gatekeepers of of uh, of uh, re 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 reproduction, right? I mean, in humanity, anyway. Um, so there's this there's this fear. Uh, you talk about a fear of rejection. I love the way Jordan Peter puts Peterson puts it. When a woman rejects a man and says, "We just want, I just want to be friends," basically what she's telling him is, "Is." Yeah, you know, you're an okay person, but I don't I don't think your genes should continue in the world. <laughs> you know, so it's this uh, you know, and she's not literally saying that, but that's in effect. That's what's going on, you know, on this sort of basic uh primal level. And, the, and so so there's a death, there's a snow pale death shimmering in the beauty in the beauty, you know, of that perfection, that perfect uh beauty, feminine beauty. And it captures that so well in the language there and talking about a TV uh movie screen of all things. And he's looking at this woman sort of take form, you know, in this, in this, uh, in the ice. And, um, he realized that, uh, well, let me first the prism of the ice might well. So I'm going to read this last part. This is the last part that I want to read just a few paragraphs here. And this is it that we're doing for tonight. And then I want to hear from Al here. The prism of the ice might well multiply her size or diminish her as you move this way or that before the empty store window. So Paladin demo talking about ice and water, you know, uh, obscuring and stuff like that. The night soft rap tapping, ever fingering, gently probing moths. Not important. Far above all, the lightning rod salesman shivered. He knew the most extraordinary thing. If by some miracle her eyelids should open within that sapphire and she should look at him, he knew what color her eyes would be. He knew what color her eyes would be. If one were to enter this lonely night shop, if one were to put forth one's hand, the warmth of that hand would, what, melt the ice? The lightning rod salesman stood there for a long moment. His eyes quickened shut. He let his breath out. It was warm as summer on his teeth. His hand touched the shop door. It swung open. Cold Arctic air blew out around him. He stepped in. The door shut. The white snowflake moths tapped at the window. That's the third time we've heard about these moths, so that's significant, right? Um, what would happen if I touched it? If I touched that, that perfect frozen beauty, I'd melt it. You know, you can't, you can't, that's the problem with perfection. You can't actually have an interaction with it because by the nature of an interaction that would imperfect it, you know, that would, uh, you know, t take it down a notch. And, um, I, I have a feeling we're never going to see him again. <laughs> well, um, but yeah, so these moths, now what do moths do? What do we know about moths Al? Um, we have any, what could moths be a symbol of? Well, I've always... <laughs> You're asking a kaiju fan, but uh, <laughs> uh, I always heard moths being a symbol of death. Okay, and we also have sayings, right? Um, you're drawn like a moth to the flame, right? Yeah, the idea that a moth seeking out the, the heat of of the warmth of light would fly right into a candle flame and burn itself up. So that's kind of on the nose right there. Boom. This is what's happening right here, right? He's yeah. being drawn like a moth to the flame to this, but also moths, you know. Um, but isn't there like a, isn't there, isn't there like a uh, a, mo a moth a symbolism of death? Isn't there there's a or or am I thinking of a particular moth or something that has like a death's head on the back of it? Or oh, I think that sounds some vaguely familiar. But you know, this yeah. idea of moth to a flame, and they're snow white moths, so they're you know in the cold, seeking out heat, but seeking it from the wrong place because that's cold and frozen where they're seeking. Um, and white standing for purity, so mm -hmm. you know, yeah. something pure being led led by. Yeah, so, you know. Troy talking about uh, moths. Uh, the, the, yeah, that's the symbol of succumbing to temptation. You know, moths drawn to the flame, and uh, you know, moths eating uh, eating away, decaying stuff like that. Uh, Chris Kitty's like moths to the flame. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to the chat, Semantic Dragon said there are plenty of cultures where marriages are arranged by a third party, or where men might be able to select several. Women. Yeah, but you know, in general, 
you got the women being the gatekeepers of that. Good old days. What? <laughs> the good old days. Wow. <laughs> Ken Jack Ben said he's a lightning rod salesman selling lightning rods in his pants, also known as metaphorical gigolo. <laughs> I thought you were going somewhere deep there, and then I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> um, well, well, so he's 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 tries to protect everyone from lightning, but at the end, he is struck <clears throat> by the lightning beauty <clears throat> himself. I'll, I'll go deep there for you. Yeah, no, I mean that's right. Yeah, he's um, you know, he's he's trying to avoid the light, avoid the the like the danger of it, but now uh, it, it 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 hooks him in a form that he can't say no to, right? So, uh, so we have it here. Casey Scott said, "Big Al would remember those days." <laughs> Another age joke for you. Uh, what? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm also the one where every time I watch the movie The Ten Commandments, and the sheet gives Moses the choice of all his daughters, and I'm sitting, <laughs> there like, man, I'm that old guy that's sitting there, is like, I wish you had my years, and I had your choice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, oh man. So uh so we've got a really good start on this book then. That's where we're stopping for tonight, but um we're going to do the next uh either 10 or 11 chapters. Go ahead and start reading. I'll let you know on Twitter it's going to be the 10 or the 11. Might as well just read 11. Yeah, 11 chapters. We'll do next 11 chapters um just to keep it keep it going at a, at a good clip. But um so the storm's coming now. The next chapter in fact, you know, next couple chapters we're going to actually find out what's what's happening here. What is this storm? You know um, what's what's going on here, and it really moves along quite well. It's a good uh, it's a good book. It takes place within a a good limited amount. Of it. It's not you know uh, drawn out, and um, it's great. You know I can't wait to do I can't wait to finish this up. Can't wait to watch the movie. But we've kind of developed our our, uh, our themes. We're moving ahead. I don't want to say too much more without giving things away. So we'll uh, we'll leave it there. But uh, are you excited to find out what happens next? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, are we are we going to be doing the movie as a rewatch Saturday night or as a special book night? Probably rewatch. a rewatch whenever we get there. Not this Saturday night, but right. yeah. Oh no 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 no! I meant no. I I I was just wondering, like, would it be like the the Saturday night or would it be a separate rewatch? Yeah, event? probably. I mean, it'd be cool if we could do it as separate. We'll see, but probably just a, just one of those Saturday night rewatches. But we'll see. <clears throat> <laughs> curious yeah we'll see when we get there um going back into the chat here you know sort said he's going deep with that metaphor just not the kind of deep you want <laughs> wow crazy kitty's reading ahead um she said, i feel chapters. like what's that so, so she read all those chapters today mm-hmm Troy said, I feel like the lightning rod salesman who is so sharp about knowing when a storm is coming doesn't see another allegorical storm coming. You're right. And isn't that the way it is? I mean, isn't that the way it is? That's, you know, you can be so wise and so on the ball. But when the temptation hits you in just the right spot that's unique to you, you become blind as a bat. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> um, your beast is a part of you. All you can do is balance your urges. Yeah. Um, because your case at Jim Nightshade is just how I was as a teen. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, all right, just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. So I've been delving deep there and didn't want to ignore the chat if anybody's got some more things like to say. With a, with a name like Nightshade, yeah, you're pretty, you're, uh, you, you don't see someone like becoming a, a priest. Mm -hmm. Hi, Father Nightshade. Nightshade just sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Father Nightshade, yeah. <laughs> Nightshade. Doctor Night, Doctor Nightshade, please. <laughs> um, Casey Lock, Lurkier, welcome. I got here late. Would be bad of me to ask the author's name so I can find this. No, no, no. It's Ray Bradbury, the great Ray Bradbury. Uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, a very short book. It'd be very easy for you to catch up and uh, and join us next time. We're gonna do these every Sunday night. Um. 11 p.m. So we're doing the next 11 chapters. So if you want to read the first 22 chapters, and these chapters are like three pages long, so don't get scared. Plenty of easily to get through that. Paladin well, Nemo says, okay. 21 chapters. 21. Yeah, yeah, 21. Sorry. Paladin Nemo says, if we do Frankenstein after something wicked, the experiment starts in November. And depending on the area, freezing cold. Good point. Yeah, I'd love to do Frankenstein. That'd be fun. 
Yeah, I've never read the original. Mm-hmm. Muhammad said, "What are my favorite books? Believe it or not, we're working through them. I mean, it and uh, in and in something wicked this way comes are right up there. They're in my top ten easily. So, um, it'd be kind of hard to to you know nail down just but I mean, yeah, these are these are some of my favorites, definitely. <clears throat> like, like the, you know, me would be Lord of the Rings, uh, Dune. Dune is definitely a big one. Yeah, we're doing Dune um at some point. Definitely gonna ramp up to the movie release. Yeah." So that's another favorite, definitely. So um, a lot of great stuff. Uh, I would love to maybe eventually do some of the classics, some of my classic favorites. Um, you know, I love some. Uh, it'd be fun to do some um, House of Seven Gables, maybe. Or um, that'd be cool. It'd be really cool to do the Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bogol- Bulgakov as a Soviet some, uh, writer. Do some Poe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Troy said, I remember Disney playing Disney film playing on the wonderful world of Disney for Halloween when I was a kid and I wanted to see it, but it came down to choice with another show on another channel. Well, we will watch that movie uh, together uh, here in this coming month. So uh, you'll get to watch it at last. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually the book version I got is the one that says now a major motion picture from Walt Disney Pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Paladin will stock up on pumpkin spice for Dune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obey. I do love pumpkin spice. I am. Um, I do too. I, I actually do too. Yes, yeah, Green Lion Girl, the I, Halloween tree I, is epic. Yeah. Not, not as a coffee because I don't drink coffee, but I really should. I've always wanted to drink coffee. I just have never been a coffee drinker. Mm-hmm. I miss the call, I, I, but I like the culture of it. Mm-hmm. The Halloween tree is a good book to have in mind if you've read it as we read this one um, because it really gives you Bradbury's. Uh, it's about Halloween and the importance of it in our culture. It is the time of dealing with death. It's the time to deal with death. You know, and Halloween tree goes back to culture upon cultures using that time of the year to, to cope or deal with the idea of death. And, uh, and that plays into this big time. And I would even give people, you know, I'm not going to talk about tonight, but maybe it's a little bit of homework. If you want Um, something wicked this way comes is a quote from uh, Macbeth. Look up mm-hmm. the quote, g- look at the context, and then um, see if you think there's anything relevant to what's going on here beyond just the, the literal meaning of the phrase, something wicked's coming, you know. Um, but it's something we'll talk about, too. It's pretty pretty neat reference. <clears throat> Troy said, I do feel like the rewatches and all the chats we have in Professor Geek's classes are all the nostalgia. It really rings when you do it and something wicked this way comes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad. It's fun. I'm, I'm having a blast doing it. I mean, it looks like it, that's the that's what's to me eighty percent of the fun I have is remembering the things I love and re-experiencing. Them. Tell us more, Charles Holloway. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> I'm a good man <sighs> in a bad season. <laughs> uh, no, but it's like. I just, I like stuff I've already, you know, I, I just stuff, stuff that I remember, but haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. 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 Like, um, seven faces of Dr. Lowe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that movie. The time, yeah. you know, the time machine. Haven't seen that in a while. Yeah. The, the George Powell stuff. Adrian Boomer said, did I ever see the movie twice told tales? Yes. Um, great movie, yeah, but really, it. Uh, completely unfaithful adaptation of all Hawthorne stories in that movie, but still fun. And Vincent Price, you oh, gotta love of, it. Most of, most of them are the ones they did with Poe. Oh yeah, even the Poe story. Totally, yeah. totally outside outside of the actual stories they yeah. just used. The game. But yeah. uh, great movie. Yeah, those I love those anthology movies with guy. You know, like there's that one with uh, was it Peter Cushing played a shop owner. I may I may have the wrong actor, but oh, okay, uh, yeah. I just saw that one last year, and I was like, "Wow, I've never seen this one before. It's awesome!" <laughs> but I love I, lo- I love it in those anthology films, from like the the Hammer film era, or, and some mm-hmm. of those stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. So uh, yeah, we got a lot of great stuff. I mean, you know, we we we're just, we'll never out we'll never outrun all of the wonderful books and movies we can study and rewatch on this channel. So we just keep bringing out the goods and 
keep having fun and you guys keep showing up. It's great. Uh, click the thumbs up if you haven't already, but I appreciate that. Got a couple more, a few more to get in for the views and, uh, and, uh, thumbs up <laughs> to average out there. <laughs> Big Al, what was that sigh about when I said I was like Jim as a teen? <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, so, just being someone who like Darlene worked in from a high school. Band. Yeah, you just see these like like super depressed kids and they don't know what depression is really about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that, it's that, it's that. Well, it's not like well, I, well, of course, some kids are going to have it, but you you got those like kids that love dressing in the black. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it's because I want to be different, and they go hang out with their five friends who are all dressed exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Troy and I think Muhammad have asked too. What's uh, what's next? Rewatch. Um, I, I still can't tell you yet. I hope to tell you. Well, I, def I will definitely let you know by office hours. But remember last night, I said I want to actually watch The Witch myself to see if it would be good. You know, if I, if I think I could do a rewatch of it. Um, and I haven't had time since last night's Monster Squad. I mean, I worked, got hardly any sleep, woke up, went to the baptism class to get you know things ready and straightened up for Alyssa to do that. Went back home, played with Alyssa, went back, went to mass, went back home, got ready for this book study. Now doing the book study. No more work to do after this. <laughs> so, it lost when, you. When, when's her baptism? Not the actual date, yeah. I just, you know, you had to go to the class oh. as part of it. But, you know, I've already talked to them, and they know that obviously we can't do a big ceremony. She's not going to sit through that. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. they'll just have to sprinkle her, you know, because she's not going to get into a big pool or she'll just be like splashing everybody with the holy water. You know? right. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> Read the pool. Everybody, Read the pool. Everybody's blessed. Everybody's blessed. You get a blessing. I you get a blessing. <laughs> you get a blessing. <laughs> I always, always loved it when the when the priest would go around with the sprinkler. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, and, uh, if, yeah. And, if, and if I got hit like with a huge big swath of, of holy water, uh -huh. I felt good. I felt good about it. I was yeah. like, yes, God's blessing me big time. <laughs> <laughs> I am looking forward to that, the scent of that, um, the oil that they use. I remember when uh, I had the oil on my forehead for my confirmation a few years ago. And man, I was like, I want to bottle some of that stuff and keep it. That stuff's smelling good. But uh, well, this olive oil is what it is, you know. Yeah, but they the put some spices and scent, <laughs> incense in it and stuff. Yeah, but. Yeah, but the the primary, the usual like when they anoint like anointing of the sick, it's just olive oil. Mm -hmm. you, I could smell that it's olive oil. <clears throat> um, Muhammad likes Lord of the Rings. Um, what's F O T R? I'm blanking on the acronym there. Catcher in the Rye, four fifty one. F O T R. What's F O T R? Uh, that acronym is not registering in my brain right now. Probably should, but it's not. The Fellowship? Oh, Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, he's saying what specific Lord of the Rings? Oh, oh, I thought it was a different book altogether. Gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, my bad. I count, I count the entire Lord of the Rings three books as one big gigantic book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't care what anybody says, and if anybody says anything, I'll produce one big gigantic book that has all the stories. Got it on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> it's um. It's interesting. They were uh, talking about uh, Muhammad's trying bringing up Coraline and stuff like that. And yeah, I was kind of thinking since he was doing the the hard, like the real gritty horror stuff. I was thinking about keeping my channel this year anyway, like the fun, the fun Halloween stuff. Like we did Monster Squad. You know, we could do you know um, some some of the classic stuff. You know, like uh, like Coraline or something like that. Nightmare Before Christmas. One of the Abbott and Costellos. Oh yeah, yeah, and some of the the classic Universal stuff too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, let me ask him if he's planning on doing the witch at any point, because he might already be planning. Yeah, I just need I'll, I promise I'll let everyone know by Tuesday, by office hours on Tuesday, I promise. But I need to ask him if you need to watch it. Yeah, but we got other things. Um, You know, we've got uh, Hocus Pocus that I would love to do. Um, Boogity, the Boogity. I need to see how easy it is for everybody else to find the Boogity movies if they're like on YouTube or something because uh, I bought them from the Disney Movie Club. I love those growing up, watching them on the Disney Sunday Night Movie. They were so awesome. Do you ever see those, Al? I forgot. I think I've asked you before. Uh, no. It's no. so good. So good. I, I, and I know it's idea, but um, I, I, saw this, I saw this girl making a no-so outfit of Oh, what is the bad? What's the the bad guy from? Uh, Oogie Nightmare Boogie. Oogie Boogie. Yeah, she yeah. was making 
like Oogie Boogie outfit. It looks so freaking wow. cool. Wow. Uh, and then that says she read The Hobbit when she was four. Oh my gosh. My brother had told wow. me about it. So I picked it up and read it by myself. Surprised the crap out of my mom that I could read at, at level four. My goodness. Yeah. Dang. Level four. It, that level at four years old. Wow. I'm impressed. Yeah. I got to go back and read The Hobbit again. It's been a long time. Yeah. That yeah, was a great one. I remember reading that too. Yeah, as soon as yeah, I knew, because I, I like I said, I read I read the Lord of the Rings late in my life. Mm -hmm. I did too, um, actually. I did too. Yeah, but uh, but it's it's been a while. It's been a while. I was in my early twenties, and um, I I grew up loving uh, Narnia, the Chronicles of Narnia, and you're loving mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis, everything by C.S. Lewis, just loving that. Talk to anybody and say, oh man, I really love Chronicles of Narnia, blah blah blah. Like they they would just do that asshole thing where they're like. Dude, you should totally read Tolkien. Tolkien's amazing. Like, okay, well, I was talking about something else right now, but if you want to go ahead and shove something else down my throat and think that's going to work, have fun with that. So I just always resisted. I was like, hell no. Screw Tolkien. I'm not going to read that. I want to talk about Narnia, damn it. And, you know, um, but eventually when I, when I knew that the movies were coming out, like it was really like the buzz is like it was announced it was going to come out like next year or whatever. Then, um, then I started from the beginning. So I read The Hobbit and then read each of the books in succession mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, fell in love with it, the Silmarillion, and all that good stuff. Yeah, I'd love to see them do Silmarillion. Like, I don't know, I don't know how they would do the Silmarillion. Uh, well, I know they're going to be doing that one that's kind of based in the early, I think, the Second Age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere. Monster House, that's a good one, too. Oh, you know what? I would love to do the house with the clocks on the wall, Al. We've oh, got to yeah. do that one. Yes, that was. That would be a good one. That so would good. be a good one. Yeah, it's we got, gotta do that. This this which it's got yeah. witches and stuff like that in it. Mm -hmm. And witches, the roll doll, the witches film with uh Angelica Houston. Angelica Houston, and they're remaking that. Yeah. Oh, they're not gonna do it well enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. So great. Yeah. Some things don't need to be remade. I know, I know. I, mean, I know. It's just I still say Kern the Barbarian, why bother remaking it? It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect yeah. as yeah. it is. Yep. Casey, uh, pronouncing your name wrong, Lohirk. Lo Lo uh, I read The Lord of the Rings when I was very young and scared myself, <laughs> gorgeous, <laughs> with the description of the ring race. Those things are serious nightmare fuel in elementary school. Man, I, I believe it, definitely. My, I, I, I remember in college during Halloween, I had a couple of friends dressed up as ring rays, the mm -hmm. Nazgul. And they were they were doing the costume contest, and a guy came across and and he's like, "So what are you?" And they said what they were, and he, and he didn't hear me, and he goes, uh, uh, "Mr. and Mrs. Darth Vader." And I was like, "Good God Almighty!" <laughs> oh, <laughs> it wow. was so sad. Cringe, cringe. <laughs> so he, um, what what? Oh uh, my. Tom, the guy, the guy, because it was a guy or a girl doing it. Mm -hmm. He grabs his like, we are the Nazgul, the ring race and such. And he like did this a great little thing. It's like awesome. Yeah. Because yeah. he, he was doing a voice. Mr. and Mrs. Darth Vader. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, hear it ringing in my ears to this day. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah. So such talking a about uh yeah, Ken Jackman, Tolkien and Lewis, they were part of the uh Oh shoot! Now I'm blanking on what their what their club was called. They had a club. They met at the Bird and Baby Pub, and uh, then when Charles Williams was with them. Would you love? Would you love to have sat at that table? Oh and my had a gosh! Beer? And they would read each other's work and like you know workshop it with each other. Like man, cock about an epic place to go back and visit. Yeah, go and have a, have a pint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been to London, but I've never been to uh, you know actual Oxford or um or uh. Oh damn! What's the? Other? It's late, and words words are just failing me. Can't think of where Cambridge. Yeah, you know, you know, but I, I'd like to go visit some of those haunts. You know, especially Lewis at Cambridge and Tolkien at Oxford and everything. So, the Inklings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Agent Boomer. The Inklings is what they were called. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, well, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think we're uh, we're about done here. We finished up the book, and uh, I've got work to do like crazy. So, um. No gaming stream tonight, unfortunately. I know, I know. I love the gaming streams, too. I have so much fun with them. But I look up at the clock, and I'm like, well, there went an entire night of work that I should have been doing. Okay. And I know you guys love it, too. So, like, well, you I know, would. so tomorrow. 
that's the one thing I was like, so it's like, he's going to be playing this game. He's going to end up streaming four or five times a week. And he's like, going to get anything else done. <laughs> I know, I know. So I have to watch myself. I have to watch myself. So definitely tomorrow. Definitely a, a gaming stream tomorrow night because nothing else is going on. So I can I can definitely set aside, okay, this is time for a gaming stream. But I really do have to get a few things recorded and published and work more on some editing and stuff like that tonight. I just got to do some stuff. You know, Prof's got to eat too. You can't just play games on the YouTube for free. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, um, did, you, did you get that uh, picture on Instagram that I forwarded to you today? Oh, indeed I did. What was it like the, yeah, best, yeah. the best things in life or whatever? What is best, what is best in life? <laughs> anyway, what is best in life? And it's uh, this like hot redhead with an open box of pizza. Like, yeah, there you go. that's that's, uh, that's yeah, like, there you go. I'm like, I know someone who needs to see this picture. <laughs> Speaking of uh, what is best in life, have you ever asked your Alexa what is best in life? Uh, no, I should though. But oh, I, didn't I've I send you? I sent you guys the video or something when I yeah, asked. Yeah, because yeah. it'll actually say the lines from the movie. Yeah, and but it, but it changes it a little bit to to like to squash ignorance or whatever, and to to hear the laments uh, or something. I don't know. <laughs> that's uh, I'll have to do that with my Kindle. Today. Yeah. Um. Green Line Girl says, "Have I given the Dynasty Warriors series of, or Samurai Warriors series a try?" No, never heard of that. Never heard of that. Um, yeah, no. Um, um, so what does it do? Yeah, yeah. It just it basically says the quote from Conan, but it changes it up a little bit to like match Alexa's mission in the world or whatever. It's funny. Ask Alexa if she likes Star Wars. Cool, I'll do that. I haven't tried that yet. I did. I did uh, knock over my. I call it Echo. I, I knocked it over one time. It like hit the floor. And I was like, no. So I picked it back up. I was like, Echo, are you okay? And I forget what it said. It was like, I'm uh, I'm really good or something like that. It was like trying to. It was jumbling the words on purpose. I was like, oh, you little smartass. Recalculating. <laughs> you, you sassy little minx. <laughs> I saw. I saw. You, you never. Did you ever watch Castle? Uh, no, but I know of it. I know it's good. I know it's serious. Uh, in like the last couple, of, the last season or something, he gets a device like that, mm -hmm. uh, like an Alexa control stuff, and is voiced by Arby Plaza. Oh, oh, nice, <laughs> nice. That's like that's what we. That's what they need is they need to make an, an Alexa dev device, but but have celebrity voices do it. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be. I think it'd be awesome. Semantic Dragon said, I really think you should consider putting out a few longer videos instead of so many short ones where you can get into the nitty gritty, but keep working hard. You're great. Thanks. I appreciate that. The problem with that is that um, you kill your YouTube channel. The algorithm doesn't work with you then and you lose the growth. You lose the because YouTube only rewards around somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes videos, preferably closer to 10 minute videos and preferably daily, preferably twice daily. If you can make that, which I'm never going to be able to do, but uh, those are that that's really had to, to, to tap into the algorithm. And then they start sharing and suggesting your channel and then you get more subs and then you get more ad revenue and then you can really, you know, make a living. So if you know, you got up to that point, then maybe I could put out more, you know, occasional longer videos here and there, but uh, they just don't get the views or they don't get the viewer retention. Cause let's face it, you know, you and two other people would actually be interested in sitting there watching the whole thing. That's it. You know, <laughs> everybody else has got something else for their squirrel. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even, I'm not even in the realm of thinking about monetizing or anything. You'll get with there my, with my one, with my wonderful 80, 80 some, uh, <laughs> viewers you'll get there i eventually. love them all the link to big house channel in the description below if you haven't subscribed yet go go do that for us give him a subscription um I'll put, I'll put up something this week i'm not sure what yet yeah or i might just live stream out of nowhere like some thought? afternoon laying there alone i'll just go you know what stream yard don't, hi anybody out there don't <laughs> don't open with that hi everyone i'm laying here alone <laughs> <laughs> For you. <laughs> Don't you want it? <laughs> this, is, this is Big Al in the morning. <laughs> Rise and shine. <laughs> oh, no, oh, man. You make it so damn creepy, Al. You're just the worst. <laughs> Like I, like I go a little bit towards the edge with a joke, and I was like, "I'm jumping over." <laughs> I jump over, dude. 
<laughs> oh, oh man. Bonsai, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So um, so we're gonna wrap this one up. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Been a blast tonight. Loved uh love this first jump week this way comes. Hope you're enjoying it and hope you'll uh, come back next Sunday for the next uh clunk of chapters, eleven more chapters we'll talk about. And yeah, we'll get through this one pretty quickly in a, in a space of you know about four sessions all together. So three more, I think, if I'm counting it right. And then we'll jump into the movie and then we'll move on to another book. And we'll talk about which kind of book we might like to do next. But I'd like to keep it sort of Halloween themed, you know, since it'll still be before before October 30th. So do check out Tales from the Stacks. Like I said, um, doing, I need to do a little bit of marketing tonight with that, which is part of the stuff on my to-do list. But uh, but yeah, you know, as soon as the art all comes in, you know, so any 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 day now or any day now, any any week now, basically, it could, um, you know, we could we could go ahead and close it. Now we'll give a few days notice, of course, you know, when it, before we close that down. So, um, also one of the things I need to do tonight too is go ahead and set up the web page on my website that explains the channel membership thing I'm doing now because I am going to close down Patreon, and I'm uh, opening it up uh, if people want to just send me a PayPal of eight dollars, um, you know, for the month. And if you just want to do it one month, that's fine. If you want to do it successive months, you can continue to do that. That's not your own, you know, you you pay for what you want, but. Uh, Eight dollars will be every Friday night only gaming stream of The Witcher. Witcher has some adult content that uh, I don't really want to show in a public stream. And we did the first one for free because it definitely taps into too much of that in the beginning of the game. But The Witcher is a great lore and a lot of great storytelling and mythology things we can discuss. And I want to do that on our members only stream. So you'll get access to that as well as a uh, channel print of some great channel art every uh, every month, you know, shipped to you, you know, if you if you want it, you know, some people don't want to go out there address, but. So there's that. So I'll put that up on um, on uh, my website. That's another thing on the to do list. But anything else from you, Al? Check out your Facebook pages. I don't know if I link to those. Want to tell people about those? Um, no, all my Facebook pages: Big Al's Review uh, Universal Iconic Universal Monsters, Iconic Batman, and Maidens of Monsters. Man, I really need to do something with Maidens of Monsters. Yeah, <laughs> it's the season, right? <laughs> tis the season. Tis the season for monsters. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, something. Uh, I may be doing something here soon about something. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, check those out. Of course, Big Al presents on YouTube for what I've got. Heck, if anything, go back and watch my first video where I'm beating people up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thanks, everybody. Uh, see you all in the chat. I see everybody signing out. So thanks for hanging out. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow for a gaming stream. Until then, and I'll have a video up too by then. But until then, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the stories you love. Thanks for watching. Ooh, I pricked my thumb. Oh, that's not good. <laughs>